How's it going, Yankee fans? My name is Alex, my co-host here, Ryan Garcia. And today we want to talk about a mock trade for Miami Marlins star pitcher Pablo Lopez. And the Yankees were engaged with Miami um, regarding Pablo Lopez at the trade deadline in early August. Obviously, that did not go through. Um, immediately after that, you know, Gleyber Torres hears that he was involved in a potential negotiation, a trade talk, and he was included in the prospect package. Um, or just the package in general. So his August was pretty bad after that. After you heard about that, everything kind of took a down, downward turn. And then he kind of elevated his game back in September. But uh, Pablo Lopez is a really intriguing pitcher. You know, Ryan knows a lot about him. We've talked about him extensively in the past. And, you know, this is a guy who would make the Yankees starting rotation one of the best in baseball. You look at Garrett Cole, Nesta Cortez. Obviously, you got Frankie Montas. Hopefully, he comes back and has a much better uh, – you know, season for the Yankees than he did towards the end of the his stretch down the down the regular season. But um, then you also have Domingo Herman and Luis Severino. The Yankees just picked up his uh, option on his contract. I think it was yesterday. So they have a pretty much set rotation, right? They're only losing Jamison Tyone. He's a replaceable arm, in my opinion. And who else to replace him than a guy that's better than him? Pablo Lopez, you know, someone who has had a lot of success in the league. He's young, 26 years old. We're going to talk about his pet repertoire. We're going to talk about what the Yankees might be willing to give up for him. Um, this is definitely an intriguing option for them as they try to put together one of the best, you know, rotations in baseball. And then hopefully they retain judge and Lopez is not earning much at all. So, you know, there's a lot to like about him moving forward, but you know, Ryan, how do you do today, my friend? And what are your thoughts on Pablo Lopez? I'm doing great. And I look at Lopez as a guy that, you know, um, is one of those, uh, it's interesting because he's more of a finesse guy, which you really wouldn't expect from a taller right-handed pitcher. You know, usually those guys are, you know, those, uh, power pitchers or, or, or guys who have those dominant fastballs that, uh, can go out and have tons of success that way. But Lopez is a different type of pitcher. He goes out, his fastball isn't necessarily dominant. It sits around 94 or 93. Um, and he can get it up a little bit in velocity, but it's not a pitch that blows batters away, it has decent results. Don't get me wrong. It's not a terrible pitch. Uh, but it isn't like a sh primary strikeout pitch. His changeup is that primary strikeout pitch. You know, that's his his bread and butter. That's been his bread and butter for a good amount of time now. Uh, he has a pretty solid cutter to boot. Um, you know, he has a decent sinker and curveball. Um, this is a guy who very much relies on his ability to command through the strike, to command through the strike zone, and uh, you know, hit his spots in order to get through a lineup. Um, and I don't think that necessarily makes him a worse pitcher. It just makes him different, right? And he's actually had a good amount of success over the last few seasons. Uh, this is a guy who I know last year struggled down the stretch a little bit, with, and he ended up with a 3.75 ERA. But since 2020, he has a 3.58 ERA over 63 starts. Um, his FIP is pretty good over that time span as well. It's a 3.48. The X FIP, the Sierra, are right around that as well. So there's no overperforming here. This isn't like a guy you would say, oh, he's getting lucky. He has a good strikeout to walk rate. He runs pretty decent batted ball rates you know no one's like hammering him necessarily um he's just a really good pitcher uh i i see him as a guy that slots in in most rotations as either you know a team's two or three but for the new york yankees he's the yankees have one of the better rotations in baseball you mentioned the guys at the top of that rotation garrett cole luis severino nesta cortez uh you know lopez is not going to be sliding in ahead of a guy like Luis Severino, but what he could do is slide, you know, ahead of a Frankie Montas or behind a Frankie Montas. You know, if Montas comes back comes back and pitches as the way he was supposed to pitch, if it was just an injury-related thing that caused him to struggle, you know, this Yankee rotation could legitimately be one of the best, uh, if not the best, in baseball. Uh, you know, I, I really do like Lopez's profile. I do think he's someone that, you know, I, I imagine is an anchor for the Yankee rotation. Being a guy who's a fastball changeup guy, he's going to be able to do well against lefties and righties. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, is this the guy that you necessarily say the Yankees, if the Yankees don't get him, the offseason's a failure? No. I look at everything related to starting pitching as if the Yankees can get better in that regard, go ahead. But you don't have to break the bank to do it. Uh, but if the opportunity presents itself, if there's mutual interest, if the Yankees um, can move a guy like Glaber in a package, you know, with some other prospects, and, you know, they probably shed salary while doing that as well, which is pretty interesting to think about, uh, and, and get a guy who's going to be in the in the middle of that rotation and give the Yankees five legitimate, you know, legitimate all-star caliber pitchers. Uh, you got to do it right. Look at the Astros. They wrought, they walked into October with a myriad of great starting pitchers, whether it's Justin Verlander, Framber Valdez, uh, whether it's Lance McCullers or, uh, you know, uh, Luis Garcia or Christian Javier or Hunter Brown or Jose Urquidy. You know, when you have high, uh, uh, an abundance of high level starting pitching, uh, you're going to have a lot of success in the postseason. And this is a team that we know uh, every team basically struggled to hit, even the Astros. Right. We, I don't think they bludgeon the Yankees to death necessarily uh, in terms of the offensive side of the ball. I don't really think they crushed the Yankees in that regard. I think the Yankees pitched decently in that series. Uh, 
you just got to outpitch some teams sometimes. I think, you know, Lopez presents an option for the Yankees to be able to outpitch anyone they face in the postseason. Well, that's the thing, right? You know, you saw Houston take advantage of us uh, with just insane pitching, and they get it at a cheap price point, too. You know, it's not like we're, they're overspending on pitching. They got a lot of those guys still, um, you know, not hitting free agency just yet. Pablo Lopez um, isn't a free agent until 2023. Uh, so, you know, they have an extra, or sorry, 2025. He's arbitration eligible in 2023. So the Yankees still have a couple years left if they wanted to go in that direction. Um, as you mentioned, more of a finesse guy. And, you know, he he finished the season with 3.75 ERA, um, you know, 3.56 XFIP. He pitched 180 innings, the most he's ever pitched in his career. 8.70 strikeouts per nine, 2.65 uh, walks per nine, not terrible at all. Uh, and about one home run per nine innings as well, 74.2% left on base rate with a 46% ground to ball rate. So, you know, you're looking at a guy here who who was proven he can be a quality pitcher, you know, give him Matt, give him to Matt Blake. We'll see maybe if he even elevates his game even further in a four seam fastball change up, cutter, sinker, curveball is his primary, you know, five pitches. The one he really, he really throws that four seam fastball and change up the most. Um, I wonder if, if, you know, you look at, uh, you know, um, Matt Blake, and he tries to extrapolate on that sinker, but he's not a high velocity guy, and he kind of likes those high velocity sinker throwers. So I think it's more about placement and movement rather than, um, you know, probably more so spin rate than it is about just pure velocity when it comes to Pablo Lopez. But he's not a high strikeout pitcher by any means. His top strikeout pitch is probably his four seam fastball with a 22% put away rate. Um, you know, definitely put together a pretty solid campaign in that regard, 76 strikeouts. Um, over 260 at bats, and his changeup is right behind that with a 21% put away rate. Um, struck out 73 batters, um, over 246 at bats. So, you know, this guy, do you think that he needs to develop some more of these pitches, Ryan, or do you think he can survive off the four seam fastball and change up in a pretty competitive AL East division? Um, I think he might have to extrapolate on, you know, one of those cutter sinker curveball pitches and just add it to his repertoire. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so uh, when we when it comes to tinkering with uh, a pitcher, you know, obviously what you don't want to do is tinker with something and cause them to you know regress a little bit. So uh, I will say that you know the the floor or the that average outcome, what he's expected to be with that fastball and changeup, is good enough that you don't want to risk it too much. Um, you know, maybe the cutter is a pitch he gets into the fold a little bit. Uh, lefties had a decent amount of success against him this season, despite the fact he's a heavy changeup guy, uh, which is a little bit surprising, especially considering, you know, in previous years, lefties didn't really hit too well off of him. Uh, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see if the Yankees are able to figure out, you know, why that was, you know, why did that occur? He also happened to really struggle at home, which is weird considering, uh, Miami is very pitcher friendly ballpark, right? He struggled in the second half. It was a very, it was a very weird year for Pablo Lopez. And I think that a lot of Yankee fans or a lot of fans in general are going to be a little bit down on him because he's coming off of, you know, struggling in that second half. Uh, but I don't think it's anything for me to be too worried about. He still doesn't get hit too hard. Um, you know, the four seam fastball and the changeup are still plus pitches. They still perform very well. Uh, could he maybe incorporate a couple more uh, curveballs in there against lefties? Maybe, you know, kind of given a different look, you could argue that, you know, uh, depth works a lot well versus lefties than horizontal movement. Uh, so maybe that's a pitch he goes to. It did generate a decent amount of whiffs uh, talking about the curveball, of course. Uh, so maybe that's a pitch he goes to. I would just be shocked to see any massive changes. I just think we're going to see a little bit better results uh, in the second half or not in the second half. We're going to see better results than what he put up this year in terms of ERA uh, because the ERA was hovering a little too close to league average. Um, but, you know, I do think that the, the curveball could be the pitch that we look at as that pitch that maybe gets upticked a little bit uh, just so he can help him against lefties just because that seems to be his struggle this season. Uh, but ultimately, I think that the profile works good enough. I think, you know, the four-seam fastball, as I mentioned, there isn't like incredible vertical break, which you usually see with those dominant fastballs that get whiffs. Uh, it's a little more of a gyro fastball, so there isn't that, you know, incredible backspin like a Garrett Cole fastball or an Esther Cortez fastball. Uh, but there, it has a ton of extension. You know, it, he, it has decent velocity. Velocity and it actually gets a decent amount of whiffs. Um, it has a good amount of success. Uh, and then the change it plays off of that as well. So, you know, ultimately, um, I look at Lopez as just, I don't think the Yankees need to tinker, tinker with him too much. And Miami seems to be pretty, pretty good with developing pitchers. So I, I don't look at them as a team that like he's coming from a Pittsburgh or not Pittsburgh now, but Pittsburgh before or coming from an Oakland or coming from a situation where that franchise really isn't too far ahead analytically. And so you think you can get more of that pitcher. Uh, but who knows, right? We, we don't work with, we, we aren't Matt Blake. We don't know what the Yankees see. Uh, and ultimately, you know, as you said, Lopez is young. This is still a young guy. He's going to turn 27 in March, you know, so this is a young kid. 
um, who's got maybe a little bit more to work with, right? You know, we don't really know what his peak is. We don't know what his prime looks like. We don't know what the best version of Pablo Lopez is just yet. And perhaps that could be something he unlocks with the Yankees in 2023 and give the Yankees, you know, that super rotation that we've always dreamed about them having alongside, you know, a lineup that potentially or hopefully has Aaron Judge back in it. Yeah, I mean, say less. <laughs> you know, it sounds pretty good when you put it like that. You know, a superstar, you know, kind of rotation here with a really good batting order. And, you know, you got Harrison Bader over from St. Louis now. So he's taking over center field. And you have a really strong outfield if you can retain Judge. Maybe you bring back Andrew Benintendi. Um, but the question is, what are you willing to give up for Pablo Lopez, right? So uh, this is kind of what the Yankees were trying to float in the direction of Miami at the trade deadline. Glaber Torres and Jason Dominguez. Um, maybe they wanted, maybe they want a Glaber Torres and Oswald Peraza. Um, you know, I don't think I'm willing to give up Peraza Dominguez and Glaber Torres seems to be a fair deal, but then you look at Dominguez, man, he's killing it right now. You know, he's, you know, elevated to Hudson Valley. He's 19 years old. He's a switch hitter. He's got all the tools to be an absolute monster. The question is, do you cash him in now? Torres is expendable. In my opinion, I think you can kind of. Uh, you know, agree with that in, in the sense that you can replace him, whether it's CJ LeMahieu, whether it's Peraza, and when Volpe takes over at, at shortstop, um, you know, we know what Torres is, but Dominguez has superstar potential. The question is, do you prospect hug for him or do you send him on his way to p- put together an elite starting pitching rotation? Given that the Yankees already have such a good rotation, I'm more willing to retain Dominguez than part ways with him now. But if we were talking about a position that was really weak, and that we didn't know what to expect from them, I'd say maybe I'm more willing to part ways with a, a prospect like Dominguez. But, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Would you be willing to, you know, include him in a deal? Yeah, Dominguez, I'd, I'd hold off on trading Dominguez at all costs. Uh, not at all costs, but in, in most situations. Um, I know that his double-A numbers on the surface didn't look great, but if you look at the postseason, he absolutely killed it for uh, Somerset. And that's a little more, to me, that matters more because you're facing better competition. And Dominguez is 19, facing the best of the best at double-A. And he crushed them he destroyed like the Somerset Patriots when they they dominated in the postseason but Dominguez absolutely torched people in that postseason uh so I look at Dominguez as a guy like dude this guy has put it together when it comes to contact when it when it comes to plate recognition his strikeout rate went down when he got promoted from low a to high a and his WRC plus went up he got better uh you know I I really do look at him as someone that I cannot by any circumstances uh move for Pablo Lopez no disrespect to Pablo Lopez but I, I look at a superstar here with Jason Dominguez uh, and a guy who's a high riser who potentially could have more value when he pr- performs at double A. Because if next year he puts up a 130 WRC plus a double A at the age of 20, he becomes one of the most valuable prospects in the sport. So, uh, you know, hold off on that for now. Uh, but for maybe a guy like Pereira, right? I look at a guy like Pereira, you know, he's a guy on the 40 man, I believe, uh, or he's who has to be put on the 40 man, or he already is. Who, you know, you look at Dominguez, you look at Pereira, and you're like, you know what? I have Dominguez in double A. Pereira is a good prospect, but I already have him, and I'm going to lock up Judge, and I already have Bader here, uh, and I might want to go out and get a left fielder. Like, maybe my outfield isn't going to be the most empty uh, come the time that Pereira and Dominguez and all these guys are ready. And I have Spencer Jones in the system as well. So maybe Pereira becomes expensive, uh, expendable, right? I'm not saying Pereira stinks or anything like that or that I don't want him, uh, but more so that, you know, we have to look at top guys. We have to figure out which of the guys the Yankees should be willing to part with. Um, and I guess the issue would become, you know, what at what point are you trading guys that you want to trade and trade versus trading for guys that the Marlins would actually want? Um, so, you know, I, I think Torres and at least gives them a boost immediately. Um, they don't really have much major league ready talent that they would be willing to trade. You know, if you look at major league willing bat, major league ready bats, that's Peraza and Cabrera. Are you willing to trade one of Peraza and Cabrera for, um, Lopez? I don't think I'm trading my opening day shortstop for Lopez, uh, unless I have plans to sign one. Um, so, you know, uh, Cabrera maybe, but even then am I trading, you know, my insurance policy in free agency, if I don't land a certain position, you know, am I trading that insurance policy? If I'm trading Glaber, why am I trading Cabrera? You know what I mean? That I'm locking out two of my infielders, right? I got to diversify there. Uh, could you see maybe, uh, more pitching side of it? Maybe Clark Schmidt's moved. If you bring in Pablo Lopez, they're roughly the same age. Are you okay departing with Clark Schmidt in that deal, making it Glaber, Pereira, Schmidt, and then another guy that could maybe work. Uh, but this is a, this is one of those deals where it's like, you know, I would, again, I wouldn't hold it against the Yankees if they don't pull the trigger on it. I would not be upset at the Yankees for not pulling the trigger on a Peraza for 
Lopez or Dominguez for Lopez. I'd be glad that they don't do that. Not because Lopez isn't great, but because I think Peraz is the opening day shortstop, and I think the world of Dominguez uh, after what he did last year. So it's it's a tough it's tough to look at for this package because it's starting pitcher who has lots of control is young. The Marlins are going to rightfully ask a lot, uh, and it, you know it's not like the Marlins are you know being. Uh, facetious to the Yankees are asking more of them than other teams. I mean, they have every right to ask for top prospects, have every right to ask for major league ready talent. That's what they're looking for. Uh, so who knows? Uh, but it's, it's tough for when it looks, when it comes to a prospect package for a guy this good with a Yankee farm, that's this good and a bunch of talent that you kind of want to start to rely on at the major league level. That's absolutely right. So you kind of have to make the decision. Are you going to mortgage your young guys? Or are you going to stick with them? And right now, I think like I got like Pereira, Pereira, like there, there are options. The Yankees can float in deals that don't have, they don't have to offload Dominguez or Peraza, whoever it might be. They can keep these players. Um, I think that they can come together and find a, a, a more reasonable um, situation. And if they are going to include one of those prospects, it has to come with the offloading of either Donaldson or Hicks's contract. You know, one of those guys has got to be paired in there and say, if you're, if you're going to, if you want one of our top prospects, you're going to have to take this money too. So that's the only way I'd see like they figure they find a way to justify it. But again, I agree with you. I think you stick with these guys that are, you know, have superstar potential. It's, it's, you don't want to give these guys up too often because eventually one of them is going to hit and he's going to be the one you sent on his way, whether it's Waldachuk or Wesneski, we're going to see what happens with them. Um, but they're very, very talented players. And, you know, now you have Montas who didn't make an impact. And now you have Scott Efros who is done for next year or two. So it's like, um, you know, obviously hindsight is 2020, but at the end of the day, giving up good prospects can be um, a bad idea uh, at certain moments. So we'll see what the Yankees do. If they do go after Pablo Lopez, would ha- love to hear your perspectives below in the YouTube comments regarding this very, very talented pitcher. And if you think the Yankees need him or if they're, if, if you'd be willing to give up some prospects in exchange for his talents. But as always, my friends, make sure to like, subscribe. And we'll catch you guys on the next New York Yankees Fireside Yankees episode. Mm-hmm.